Hey guys, it's your favorite reliability test guy here with another fun-filled action-packed video on reliability tests and validation topics. This current video is an introduction to thermal shock testing, how components, subsystems, and systems are tested and subjected to thermal shock events. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you do, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and let's get started! In this video, we will cover definitions, types of thermal shock tests, and application and setup of thermal shock testing. Let's go ahead and cover some definitions. So what is thermal shock? Thermal shock is a sudden change in temperature of a material or part from its equilibrium state at a rapid rate. Thermal shock is used to evaluate the effects of sudden rapid changes in temperature on a subsystem, subsystem, or component. Many of you have probably seen some form of reaction due to thermal shock. For instance, when you pour cold water into a heated glass. If the glass cannot handle the sudden rapid change in temperature, guess what happens? Yep, you end up cleaning up broken glass that has shattered due to the thermal shock event. What about with electronics? Same thing can happen. When you take a heated circuit card and place it in, let's say, a refrigerator for simplicity's sake, what can happen? Well, weak solder joints can crack, as can be seen in picture B. Or a component susceptible to the thermal shock event may cease to operate. So why do materials such as glass and solder joints break due to the sudden change in temperature? When you heat a material, it begins to expand and relax, kind of like an engineer over the weekend drinking beer after a hard week at the office. Well, when the object is subjected to a cooling effect from a lower temperature medium such as air or liquid such as water, the material rapidly contracts and tightens up, which causes the material to fracture or break. Just like an engineer who comes back to the office all loose and relaxed and immediately has a mental breakdown when he discovers that his boss took his red stapler. Yeah. This brings us to our next point. Types of thermal shock tests. While thermal shock can be used to simulate real life use cases and corner cases as with broken glass, thermal shock is often used to drive out defects in both the design and manufacturing process. By cycling hot and cold temperatures at a rapid ramp rate called degrees Celsius per minute or degrees Fahrenheit per minute for those non-scientific or engineering types out there, you can accelerate temperature changes as seen in the field during heat up and cool down periods and drive out latent defects in your design and manufacturing process. Ramp rates or degrees per minute is a simple calculation to make. You simply take the delta of your temperature range and divide it by the amount of time it takes to transition between the temperatures. There are several methods to accomplish this. The first is to use a specialty chamber called a thermal shock chamber as pictured. Thermal shock chambers have a hot and cold box. A test part or system is placed in what is called a basket as pictured. The basket transfers either vertically or horizontally depending on your thermal shock chamber type between the hot and cold boxes of the thermal shock chamber. Typically, the transition between hot and cold boxes happens at a ramp rate greater than or equal to 20 degrees Celsius per minute. Thermal shock chambers are more expensive than traditional temperature test chambers, and depending on the size of the part or system you are testing, can be super expensive. Another solution is to use two temperature test chambers and condition one chamber to your hot temperature set point and the other to your cold temperature set point. You would then manually transfer your part or system between the two chambers after a specified soak period. The downside to this is you will need to run multiple shifts and have technicians or engineers running the tests on day and night shifts, depending on your soak periods and number of cycles, so keep that in mind. Let's cover another type of thermal shock test, liquid thermal shock testing. This is where you have a container with a liquid such as water at a hot temperature and another container of liquid at a cold temperature. Using a liquid to perform thermal shock creates a worst case thermal shock condition as liquid such as water is a better conductor of heat than air. However, it is probably pretty obvious to most of you that water and electricity don't mix. So keep that in mind when deciding how to run your tests and don't throw parts or systems into a container of water as water can also be an excellent conductor of electricity. Now, I'm not saying that you should never do an immersion thermal shock test. I'm just saying take precaution and don't do the tests on non-sealed electronic boxes or electrical devices with open or exposed contacts. The third type of test is a hybrid test 
which is part air and part liquid thermal shock tests. For instance, you may take a part or system and put it into an oven and heat soak and then drop that part or system into an ice bath or cold water. This is an example of an air to liquid thermal shock test as you are moving between a hot or cold ambient air temperature environment and then submersing the product or system into a heated or cooled liquid environment. So let's quickly discuss the intent of thermal shock testing. Thermal shock testing is typically used for one of the following reasons. The first is to detect latent defects by rapidly changing the ambient temperature of the part or system you are testing. This can help you find weaknesses in your design and production process as a result of the rapid contraction and expansion of the materials for the part or system you are testing. The second reason is to accelerate the effects of environmental temperature changes in a diurnal temperature range over many years, especially with systems that are placed outside and exposed to the elements. Thermal shock can be used to quickly assess the resistance of your system to cyclical temperature stresses that produce mechanical or material fatigue as different parts of your system expand and contract at different rates. Let's go ahead and jump into thermal shock application and setting up a thermal shock test. First, let's cover the intention of the test. Is this a manufacturing screening process or design verification or validation test? For production screening, you will need to determine the temperature range and number of cycles that will be required to detect latent defects while ensuring that the thermal stress levels and number of cycles do not produce unnecessary damage or fatigue to your part or system. For design verification and validation tests, you should look at both temperature and cyclical data for how your system heats and cools internally from its own operation, and also look at worst case temperatures of the environment that your system will be subjected to. Let's cover some tips for the logistics of thermal shock testing and planning, and implementation of thermal shock testing for your system. For production tests, system level testing may not be feasible or cost and time effective. For instance, testing a passenger vehicle or industrial compressor for thermal shock on a production floor would be incredibly expensive and would require a tremendous amount of time for a large system to reach thermal equilibrium at hot and cold temperatures. The more mass a system has, the more thermal inertia it has or resistance to change in temperature. Or the more mass a system has, the slower it will change temperature and move towards thermal equilibrium. Therefore, for larger systems, if you want to implement a production thermal shock process, put that activity on your component and subsystem suppliers and perform thermal shock at the component and subsystem level. It's much cheaper and will be much faster to assess production issues at the part level rather than the system level for production defects. That doesn't mean that you perform thermal shock on every part, that's not what I'm saying here. You run thermal shock on parts that have been identified as a risk to thermal cycling or thermal shock in your DeFEMA and PEFEMA. With a large system, the temperatures will change so slowly that you will most likely not be able to detect latent defects that can be driven out by thermal shock stress, which is why it makes more sense to run thermal shock on parts and subsystems identified to have the greatest risk. Similar thing for the design verification and validation side. Your system may be so large, it will neither be cost effective nor time effective to perform the test at the system level. Okay, let's quickly define the application of each type of test and where to use it that we just defined. Perform an air to air thermal shock test is the most common type of thermal shock test and will most likely be the test type that you go with. Depending on the size of your system, you may either want to purchase a thermal shock chamber which gives you the flexibility to automate the transition between hot and cold temperature boxes. However, thermal shock chambers are more expensive than conventional thermal test chambers. If your system is fairly large, like a desktop computer, or perhaps even a larger system like a high voltage battery pack, it will be much cheaper from a capital standpoint to transition the system between two conventional temperature test chambers to generate the thermal shock stress. The liquid to liquid thermal shock test is the most severe test of the three types of thermal shock tests and can be too severe for most simulated applications, depending on your liquid temperatures and the environment you are trying to simulate. However, there can be applications for this test or use cases for this test where it makes sense to run liquid to liquid thermal shock. For instance, let's say you have an industrial process that requires a robotic arm to be submersed in hot vat of liquid and then moved over to a cold vat of liquid. This would be a good example of an application of a liquid-to-liquid -liquid thermal shock test. 
The third type of test is the hybrid thermal shock test that can consist of air heating in an oven followed by immersion in an ice bath as an example. This has practical applications, especially in the ground vehicle industry, where a vehicle may be stored in a warm garage overnight and then driven out into a cooler environment and perhaps crosses a shallow stream or deep puddle of cold water, which causes the part or vehicle to be thermal shocked. There are standards that call out immersion tests that require preheat in the system prior to immersion in cooler water, including mill standard and ISO specifications. With that being said, for most applications, air-to-air -air thermal shock will be the way to go when testing your system. Let's jump into setup and planning for thermal shock now. First, we will cover temperature set points. The ideal approach would be to understand your product's worst case temperature environments and frequency of temperatures and the diurnal cycle for the environment your system will be installed in or will be operated in. You can use these cases to create temperatures or even apply an acceleration factor to expedite stresses to identify potential failure modes. If you are not sure or need a quick solution for what temperature to test, refer to an industry-specific specification for your system or product, which will have guidelines on temperatures and cycles to use for your test. Let's talk about soak times now. You need to soak your system long enough for the system to achieve thermal equilibrium. This can be less than an hour for small systems or parts, but can take hours or even days or more for larger systems. For larger systems, try to be creative in reducing soak times, such as identifying features of your system that can be used and leveraged to reduce soak times, such as active cooling. For instance, if you have a system that is liquid cooled, you can run higher and lower temperatures that match the temperature chamber set points and speed up the change of temperature to reach your set point and thermal equilibrium for your system. You can also get creative with your test setup as well by using cold plates or hot plates or even liquid nitrogen and heating blankets to speed up thermal shock testing. So if you need to reduce the time for your thermal shock test, get creative, put on your engineering thinking cap, and come up with an innovative solution. Or you can reach out to me and I can help you figure out how to reduce test times for your thermal shock tests. Next up is instrumentation. You may want to characterize your system during the thermal shock test and perhaps you want to know what your system's equilibrium point is and how long it takes. You can apply thermal couples to your system both internally and externally and attach it to a data acquisition system to measure the temperatures and the rate of change of temperature and determine when you reach thermal equilibrium for your system during a thermal shock test. A quick word of advice. If you are moving your product or system between two conventional thermal test chambers, you will want to put quick connects between your temperature data acquisition system and the thermal couples attached to your system to make moving from chamber to chamber easier and a quicker process. Make the setup as easy as possible and as portable as possible to move by placing all support equipment on carts or benches with wheels so you can change between test chambers more rapidly. And that's it folks! Some key takeaways from this video are determine the equipment you will need for your test. Typically this is driven by the size of your system and the cost of the test equipment and what you have readily available at your company or a supporting third-party lab. Determine the type of test. For more applications, air-to-air -air thermal shock is typically the way to go. If you know what you are doing, establish the temperature and cycles to achieve the requirements for the thermal shock test you are performing. If not, use an industry-specific standard, or you can even reach out to me for help. Think outside the box, and consider how to both execute your test with the least amount of effort possible and reduce test time as much as possible while achieving your desired goal for the test. Thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions or comments, or you need help with thermal shock testing, feel free to reach out to me at one of the links below. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of your day!